Glad that you're here this afternoon for this session. I think that, uh, I think it's a very important session and what I'm going to give you um, is very incomplete. I want to tell you that right from the get-go. It's very incomplete. Um, the reason is that online I have probably 10 or 12 messages that comprise something that I call the Peace of Mind series. It's available on sermonaudio.com. In my entire ministry, pastoral ministry of 31 years, there is no series that I have presented that has been more effectively used of the Lord than that particular series. And I'm actually surprised by that uh, because I didn't realize until some things happened in my life, I didn't realize what a serious matter this is. In our circles, there's a tendency not to want to talk about these things, or there's a tendency when you talk about uh, depression and anxiety, there's a tendency for us very quickly as pastors to spiritualize it. In other words, we dismiss it quickly as something that's just a matter of a spiritual problem. Now, um, if you're one to do that, for example, if you said to someone who comes to you and says, Pastor, you know, I think I have depression, I'm just really down. And if you're one to say, well then, you know, you need to read your Bible and pray more, okay? You are doing more harm than good. It's not bad to read your Bible, it's not bad to pray, you should do those things. But to use that as a panacea to someone who really has uh, an issue that may be way more deep-seated than that, uh, you can damage someone's spiritual walk because they can actually lose faith in the Lord uh, by bad advice. Never give to a person who's suffering in this way a kind of a pat answer. You don't want to do that. Um, it's really important to be very upfront with people. And I think for pastors, we've got a lot of pastors in the room today, um, I think your knowledge base on this should be substantial enough to deal with it at the level you can deal with it and substantial enough for you to know when it's too serious a matter and you need to pass it on to someone else. Okay, let me do a, a few disclaimers before I really get into what I want to say uh, today. Number one, I am not against medicine, okay? I'm not against medicine. I think it is very irresponsible for pastors to uh, tell people to quit certain medications, okay? Not only is that irresponsible, it's dangerous. There are certain medications that people are on for anxiety and depression uh, that if they quit them cold turkey can cause things such as stroke, okay? And you don't want to be responsible for that. Uh, you're not a medical doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I do not claim to be. And so I don't dispense medical advice per se. I think it's really important to understand that. Um, I think also in relationship to this, it's important to relate to people and to understand that their problems are real. Their problems are real. Um, I think about it this way. I am a trichotomist. As, how many trichotomists in the room? That means body, soul, and spirit. Trichotomists? Okay. How many dichotomists in the room? Just the, just the body and the soul slash spirit. Anyone like that in the room? Okay, no one like that in the room. The rest of you don't know what you are. Uh, I believe, I believe that, that God made us made man in his own image. Uh, God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, a tripart being. And so I think that we are made the same way. And I think the Bible bears that out. I'm not going to defend that position. But all of us, it's obvious that we have a body. It's obvious we have that. It's obvious that we have a soul. Okay, everyone has a soul. That's the mind, will, and the emotions, uh, those things. And then, of course, we have a spirit. And the spirit is dead until it is made alive by regeneration, by faith in Christ. When we, when we are born again, that's when the spirit part is made alive. Um, when you think about the matter of mental health or, or, or anxiety and depression, um, there are three things. If you have a body, soul, that's the mind, will, and emotions, and a spirit, there are three things that must work together for your complete being to be right. In church, most of the time, you're going to hear pastors talk about the spiritual aspect. That is our, our job. And so we emphasize the spiritual things. Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. We emphasize spiritual. That is very good. Um, one of the things that we don't emphasize very much at all in independent fundamental Baptist circles is the body. We don't talk about that because that would lead to the possibility of mentioning gluttony. And in our circles, we're not going to go there because... Because when you're an independent fundamental Baptist, food is all you have, okay? That's, that's, you're, you're really limited in your recreational options, and so we're not going to necessarily talk about the body. We, we should talk about that more. By the way, I don't have time to talk about all three, 
but I will do this after the session. I'm going to stay here, and if some of the men want me to talk about the body, the physical aspect of some real good answers that you can have, I will be happy to do that, okay? I'm not going to keep you over time for that, but I think it's absolutely a key to what I'm talking about, and so I will be happy to do that, even if at the, I think at the end of this session we're done for the, the day until the evening session. So if a group of men wants to come down here and me to talk to you personally about this, then I will talk to you and I will answer questions as well in regard to that. And then the, the, um, the spirit we talk about in church, the body we don't mention very much, but then the soul, the soul occasionally in our churches gets honorable mention, but not systematic mention. And the soul, remember, is the mind, will, and emotions. So the soul comprises our ability to process thinking. Everyone, saved or lost, has an ability to process thinking. And you say, Pastor Monty, this sounds psychological. No, I'm about to demonstrate it is incredibly biblical. Because throughout the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, but especially the New Testament, and especially in the teaching of Jesus and Paul, there are specific guidelines for our thinking. Now, they are not presented in the Bible as a systematic psychology. They're presented in the Bible as, as, as points of Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, things the Apostle Paul said specifically in the book of Philippians, and they're presented in, in such a manner that unless we study them and connect the dots, we don't make adequate application. What I want us to do this morning for a little bit is connect the dots, and we're going to talk about the soul part of this. You have your notes in front of you, Proverbs 23, verse 7, as he thinketh in his heart, or sometimes we quote it, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Okay, here's a principle that undergirds everything that I'm about to say. I cannot give you all the sessions. I have four or five sessions that I do for churches and, and, and other places. We've used it in Mayo, Michigan as an evangelistic tool, actually. Uh, but I, I can't give you all of that first session, but you have to understand the foundation. Okay, as a man thinketh, I want you to picture in your mind a, a big triangle right here, a big triangle. Uh, as a man thinketh, now watch, the first corner of the triangle, and you could write this in your notes, you could jot this down, the first corner of the triangle are your thoughts, as a man thinketh. Those are your thoughts, okay, that's, you've got a triangle in your mind, the first corner is the thoughts. As a man thinketh, the pinnacle of the triangle, as a man thinketh in his heart, that is your emotions, okay, that is your emotions. And then the other corner of the triangle, uh, so is he, that is your behavior. So on your, if you're writing this down, you've got the thoughts in this corner, you've got the emotions on the pinnacle, and then in this corner, you've got the behavior. Now watch this, watch this. My thoughts produce my emotions. My thoughts produce my emotions. My emotions drive my behavior. That is fundamental to human existence. That is the plain teaching of scripture. The way that I think, what I ruminate upon, what I meditate upon, how I process things, that promotes my emotions, whether my emotions are happy or they're sad. I can cause you to cry by telling you sad stories, watch this, and getting your mind fixated on that sad story. So now all of a sudden your thoughts are fixated on a very sad story, and I have by manipulating your thoughts as a speaker, and by the way, manipulation's not bad, okay? It's not bad, okay? I'm trying to get you to do something good. If you call that manipulation in a negative sense, then, then you don't understand preaching, okay? But I can manipulate your emotions by planting thoughts into your head. You ruminate about those things, you follow along with my sad story, it produces an emotion, and then an emotion can drive a behavior, okay? And so understanding that. Now, you say, Pastor Marty, what, what does that mean? It means this, we have to control our thinking. Now, I want everyone in this room to listen to me. When you talk about processing your thoughts, I cannot control your thinking for you. Your wife cannot control your thinking for you, your spouse. There's no way. I must control my thinking. And right away someone says, well, Pastor Marty, you know, <laughs> you know I, I, I don't... Think about my thinking. I mean, I, I just think thoughts. Do you know most people do that? Yeah. They let their thoughts jump around in their brain like a bunch of wild broncos. And it is no wonder why our emotions are moved by these thoughts that are completely uncontrolled. And it's funny to me because we would promote discipline in every area of life except our thought life. 
well, we, you know, we ought we to discipline ourselves to get some form of exercise. We, we, we talk that way. We, we don't do it. But we, 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 we think that's a good idea. And we said, well, we ought to have the self-discipline to make your bed in the morning and the self-discipline to read your Bible. You better have the self-discipline of prayer. No one ever talks about the self-discipline of straightening out your thinking and controlling what you think. Now, this is not in your notes. You need to jot this down. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. In fact, turn there very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Is there a biblical basis for the idea of controlling your thoughts? You better believe there is. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Here it is. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, here it is, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, that verse has been used for a long time in our circles to talk about dirty thinking. And this is the answer. We've got, you know, if, if you have a problem with sensual or sexual thinking, you need to do what this verse says. And, and universally, we've kind of applied that verse, and by the way, not a bad application, okay? But we've, we've kind of applied it to that. We've limited the application. The application, in fact, it doesn't mention dirty thoughts per se. What it mentions is this, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What are, what are the thoughts that are, that are problematic in verse number five? Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Okay, there's a mental struggle that every person in this room faces. The facts that we know are true from the word of God and the things that our mind tells us. And there's a struggle between those two. We are to capture those thoughts that are not appropriate, and we are to bring them into the captivity of Christ. We are talking about a mental discipline. Now, there are certain thoughts that you refuse to think, okay? Anything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. One of the things that creates anxiety is when I think about a problem and I leave God out of the equation. Yeah. Well, I'm Pastor Monty, wait a minute, you're a pastor, you would never do that. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Okay. Uh, that, that is most, for many of us, that's our go-to. And God is not, if God's not in our thought, it, it, that thought has exalted itself against the knowledge of God, against the knowledge of who he is. So understand that we capture the thoughts, some thoughts we have to refuse. Uh, but then, then, okay, we're still struggling with how do I do this? Now, I, I wish I had enough time. And is there a clock in here somewhere? 235, okay, I'll just put my phone here and then look at it occasionally. Or someone wave to me when there's five minutes up, okay? I've got, I've got an hour here. Um, th there are several paradigms of thought. I wish I had time to go into these with you. If you want to go on Sermon Audio uh, and look at, that, look at that message series, you can get some of those. But remember this, remember this. Our peace, our personal peace, is not something that is passive. I want you to turn now to Philippians, please. The book of Philippians. And I want you to see something very practical. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Look with me, if you will, at verse 5. Let your moderation, the idea there is self-control, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Okay, now some people say, well, the word careful means worried. Well, in a general sense, it does mean worried. But a better, in a better word for it is the word careful. Okay, now watch. Uh, watch. Well, Pastor Mike, you know, uh, shouldn't we be careful when we're crossing the street? Yes. But the Bible word here talks about being filled up with care. Okay, it is reasonable and right to exercise caution. It is not appropriate, according to Scripture, to be filled with care, filled to overflowing with care. We use the word anxiety. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a King James guy, 100%. Some of your modern translations are going to translate that anxious, and that, that, that's them, that's not us. But the better word is careful. For a person to be so filled with, uh, filled with care that he's not able to function, that it becomes debilitating, that the anxiety consumes every aspect of his life, the word careful, I think, is the best word for that. So he says, Paul says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now look at verse number seven. And the peace of God. The peace of God comes after we do certain things, okay? Really important to understand this. That, that means this, folks, listen. God is not a heavenly Xanax. Yeah, that's right. People will say something like, well, Pastor Money, I'm going through a real hard time. I'm just praying that God sends me peace. And, and what you're asking for is some dove to descend from heaven, carrying a Xanax, 
and pop it in your soul to bring you peace. God says, no. He says, be careful for nothing. That means you, well, how can I stop this? I'm responsible for doing everything I can to control my thinking. God's peace comes after I do the things that I'm supposed to do. Uh, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Pastor, when does that happen? It happens when I learn to control my thinking, okay? Peace is not a passive experience. We need to start praying about everything, of course. We embrace our situation in prayer. We do so thankfully. But only when we're obedient to Scripture does this work. Now, let me be very practical. Some years ago, about two and a half, a little more than two and a half years ago, I went through a difficult time in my life. My twin brother, who was a preacher, um, committed suicide. And that was the beginning of a very dark spiral. When our brother a moment ago was talking up here, everything he said I could relate to. My, my anxiety and depression at that time was not as debilitating as his was in a public level, but it certainly was on a private level. And I came to the conclusion that I had to get help for myself or I would not be able to continue doing the things that I do. Every week of my life, I speak six times every week of my life. And I could not keep up with that unless I got some help for myself. I desperately needed that. And so in thinking about this, I started saying to myself, what does the Bible teach about my thinking? And can I be honest with you, gentlemen? Some of us in this room, many of us in this room, and possibly most of us in this room, are driving ourselves crazy. Now, there is a physical component to this, which I will talk to you about, whoever wants to stay after, because I'll be glad to do that, okay? There's a physical component, but there is a mental component. And when I allow my mind to work outside of the recommendations, the commands of Scripture, when I do that, I've opened myself up to personal damage by the way that I process things, okay? For, for example, I'll give you an example. It's not in my outline here. Uh, example, let's say... Um, Let's say it was beautiful this morning, wasn't it? Beautiful weather, beautiful weather. I don't know about what it was up here uh, yesterday, but in Indiana it was pouring down rain. And I had a funeral, and, and everything was just getting wet, and it was just miserable. I could have, when I woke up in the morning, I checked, yeah, it's raining outside. I could have done one of these numbers. Oh, I can't believe this. It's raining outside. And we're going to have to stand there in the rain. And when we carry the casket into the, into the hearse, everyone's going to be wet. And I, I just don't understand. Why does it have to pour like I could have poured tons of emotional energy into that. Do you know what? It's out of my control. It's out of my control. Okay, how many are from Michigan? How many know winter is out of your control? Okay, okay. If you push against that emotionally... You cannot change it. You can only damage yourself. Here is an example of a rule. I refuse to think about something that I cannot control or change. Period. Period. Now, I'll do my best in a given situation. Don't misunderstand. But if it is outside of my control, what good does it do for me to ruminate about it over and over and over and over and over again? And by the way, if all you're doing is thinking about it, whatever happened to prayer? Whatever happened to the scripture that says, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He used to pass money, you know, one of, my, one of my kids, they're not doing right, and I'm just so burdened, I'm, I'm just falling apart, and all I can think about is the fact that my kid isn't doing right. Ho, 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 ho. Is that doing your kid any good, that you're falling apart? No. In fact, ultimately, it will do greater damage. You say, preacher, what do you do? In everything by prayer and supplication, verses I just read, let your requests be made known to God. Do you know what you need to do with some things? When something is out of your control, you go to a place of prayer and you say, God, I've done everything I can. I, I do this sometimes. God, I've done everything I can. Lord, if there's something else I should do to help the situation, I'm going to sit here quietly and maybe you can bring something to my mind. And then I sit there quietly and I wait. And normally nothing comes to my mind, which is true about most of my life, but, but, but normally nothing comes to my mind. And so then, then I say, Lord, I am giving this to you. Now watch this. I am casting my burden, the burden that I'm carrying, the thing that is weighing me down emotionally, 
I'm casting that thing now. Lord, I'm giving it to you. I, when we, we used to live next to a Methodist church, and they had a cross in the back field there, and they had a little, little sitting area, you know, for the Methodist, whatever kind of ceremonies they have. I don't even know. It's probably Masonic. But anyway, they, they, had, uh, they had this thing. And I would go there, and I would do this, and I would cast my burden on the Lord, and then I would say, Lord, now I'm getting up from here. I've given this to you, and here was the secret. I'm not thinking about it anymore. You say, Pastor Monty, is that possible? It's possible, but it's hard. Can I tell you something about mental self-discipline? Mental self-discipline is self-discipline, okay? I, I would say spirit-empowered self-discipline, but it is self-discipline non nonetheless. And it's a hard thing to do, but if you will practice this, do you know what's going to happen? Within two weeks of consistently seeking to practice this, you will build mental muscle. And your mind will actually say, oh, some, some, a thought will come to your head. And you'll say, oh, no, I don't, I don't think about that anymore. Or I gave that to the Lord. And then you'll go on. But it's going to take two weeks to see the mental muscle start building. Now, that's just an example of what I'm talking about here. So the peace of God comes when I obey the Bible in controlling my thinking. Now, I want you to drop down... When Philippians chapter 4, I want you to look at something. This is important. Verse number 8. Philippians 4 verse 8. Do you know what this is? This is an agenda for what you're allowed to think about. Yeah, amen. Right here. This is a list. This is a list. You're, you're fundamental Baptist people. You like lists and you like rules. Okay, so here it is. Here are the regulations right here. Here is the dress code for your brain right here. Finally, brethren... Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, look what it says. Think on these things. Do you see that? Okay, the assumption is, look, listen, the assumption is you can control your thinking. Yeah. The Holy Spirit says so because you're commanded to do so. By the way, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Don't forget about that verse. But he says, once you've done these things, verse number 8, once you've done these things, he says, verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and uh, heard, uh, heard, received and heard and seen in me do. Now, then look what it says. And the God of peace shall be with you. When is he with you? When do you experience peace? When you do what the Bible says says okay but you have to work at this okay you have to work at this now what i'm giving you today is one small segment of a very of a very lengthy teaching that's available to you online i want to talk about the first thing paul said in philippians 4 verse 8 finally brethren whatsoever things are true okay the first way that i'm going to think about my thinking and remember 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 10, verse 5, we're to capture our thoughts, okay? Don't let your thoughts just wander around aimlessly. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do when I think about my thinking is this. I'm going to say, does it pass the test of being true? Now, some say, oh, Pastor Mania, of course I'm just going to think about things that are true. Oh, really? Oh, really? The fact of the matter is, I find myself more often thinking about things that are not true than about things that are true. And in fact, I have the, the incredible ability of tormenting myself over something that has never happened. I'm very good at that. Well, you know, Pastor Monty, obviously you believe the King James Bible, so you're thinking about things that are true. I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about doctrinal things here. I'm talking about how I process life and how I process and ruminate about the things of life. So what does it mean what sort of things are true? Folk, you can jot this down. I don't know if it's in your notes or not. Jot this down. Can I tell you this is revelatory right now? If it hasn't happened, it is not true. This is huge, okay? If it hasn't happened, it is not true. Now, I am not talking about propositional truth. I'm talking about circumstances in our lives. I'm talking about the things about which we torment ourselves. If it hasn't happened, it is not true. Based upon that, I want you to beware of some things. Number one, beware of intuition. Beware of intuition, okay? A lot of people read into things and they ruminate on their intuitive conclusions. Some time ago, have, have any of you in the room ever taken a personality test online? Anyone ever done that? If you haven't done it, it's fun. You should do that. You should do that. There's a test called the, the 16 personalities, and you answer all these questions and by the way answer it honestly 
your wife should help you answer the questions, fellas, okay? Because, because you know, you're going to, don't answer like the way you, you wish you were, you know, like, like uh, are you strong and confident in every situation? You're going to check the box, yes. And your wife's going to say, uh-uh, remember, 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 remember this, okay? Take, if you take that test, it helps you to get a baseline for your personality, okay? It, it helps. I am intuitive. Part of my, there's a four-letter thing that they assign to you. Part of that is I am intuitive, okay? And that means I am really good at reading between the lines. I'm an extrovert, that's obvious. By the way, the cool thing about this test, I don't know if it still does it, years ago when I took the test, they, uh, they would assign you a celebrity that, was, that had the same personality that you do. They, they, they will tell you a celebrity. Um, I have a celebrity that I share personality with. You know who it is? Someone said to me, Ronald Reagan. No, no, no. Someone said, oh, it must be Winston Churchill. No, Carol Burnett, okay? <laughs> And some of you are old enough to remember Carol, okay? Uh, Carol Burnett, and I thought she was just funnier than a crutch. Carol Burnett, okay? I share a personality with her. Uh, but intuitive means that I tend to read between the lines. Um, I read into words and circumstances. I will tend to fill in the blanks. Pastors are guilty, guilty, guilty. Well, Pastor Monty, I absolutely know that this is what is happening. How do you know that? Do you have a crystal ball? If you do, you're not a very good Baptist pastor. Do you read tea leaves or do you do palm readings? No, but Pastor Monty, I just know. And then we torment ourselves over things we assume and guess at intuitively, claiming that we have this higher knowledge because after all, we are people, people, and we have dealt with people for decades. And then we come to find out that what we had built up in our mind is not true. Look at point B. Intuitive people tend to believe their intuitive conclusions as truth, even without much real evidence. How about this statement? I can't prove it, but I know I'm not wrong about this. Hmm. That sounds like a real pastory thing to say. Because after all, you're not only a pastor, you are an Old Testament prophet. The truth is, when we, when we place ourselves in the position mentally that our intu intuition, that our reading between the lines is 100% accurate, we then torment ourselves with conclusions that may or may not be true and frankly usually are not true. And until we find um, a demonstrable proof that they're not true, we continue the tormenting with this. It's into intuition. Paul said, think about things that are true, not things that you think might possibly be true. Point D, intuitive people often act in error based on intuition alone. Uh, have you ever, you know, you know th this, this drives me crazy. When someone comes up to me and says, and this happened last week, Pastor Monty, I, I need to meet with you. Okay, let's meet. Okay, Pastor Monty, I, I just, just want to know, is there, there's, there's something between us, isn't there? A guy in my church, there's something between us. You're, you're mad at me. Huh? Well, I, I know you are. I can just sense it. What? Do, 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 do. You sense? I, I, I said, no, I'm not mad at you. And he's like, well, you mean you're not thinking this, 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 and this? I said, no, I've, I've never thought that. Well, but I'm sure you're thinking this. Dude, you can't be sure because you're not in my brain. I wanted to say, your biggest disappointment would be if you knew how little I actually do think about you. Okay, that's, 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 that's what I wanted to say. Okay, now, being a pastor, I can't just say stuff like that, okay? Uh, but but uh, his, somehow he got an impression and he built that up in his mind over a period of time, and hyperactive intuition took place, and all of a sudden there's a problem between me and him, and I would never think that, and it took me a long time to talk him out of the idea. Because how do you talk someone out of, well, Pastor, I, I just know you're thinking, huh? How do you do that? Okay, that's a, an example of intuition, and it's very, it's very dangerous. Um, intuitive people overemphasize intangible signals from others, often interpreting them as negative. I have a feeling he doesn't like me anymore. That's point C. I missed that one. Uh, intangibles, okay? Well, you know, Pastor Monty, so-and-so passed me in the church lobby, and they didn't even look my direction. What? And we as pastors, we as pastors... When people do that to each other and then they come to the pastor who's wearing a referee outfit and he's got a whistle around his neck and they tell us that, we're just like, oh, this just wipes me out. 
And then we as pastors, we do the same thing. We do the same thing. Well, you know, I'm, sister so-and-so, was, was, she just was in a foul mood toward me. Something, something's up with them. We say to our wives, we say to our wives, something's up with the Smith family. They, they, didn't, they, were, they, were, they were not themselves. Uh, by the way, we are so good pastors at personalizing everything that happens. It's amazing. Can I, can I let you in know a little secret? You're not the center of anyone's universe but your own. Pastor, if we would realize that as preachers, it would really help us, okay? Well, you know, I'm, I'm sure the Smith family is thinking this, 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 and this, and this about the ministry. They're probably not thinking anything about the ministry. Well, Mr. Smith was so out of sorts. Maybe he has gas. Okay, you, you read into, you read into things intuitively, and, and, and being able to be sensitive about people can be a good thing, that's a good thing, but you read into things intuitively sometimes and you make yourself miserable over this. Uh, the problem with running, with ruminating over intuition is that intuition by its very nature, by its definition, is not verifiably true. At best, fellows, it's a guess. And it's usually a guess that's a million miles off the mark when you find the facts behind it. But when we practice this and torment ourselves with this kind of thing, all of a sudden, what are we doing? We're tormenting ourselves in such a way as to disobey the Bible. Because the Bible says I'm supposed to think on things that are true. My youngest son, a few weeks ago, he took a job at a Chewy Pet Food Company. He, the internet pet food company, he took a job there, and um, he's 23 years old. And he, it's a hard company to work for, very hard company to work for. And he's been working there for a few months. And someone called him and said, hey, we want to have a meeting with you next week in the office. And so he is very conscientious. He's a hard worker. Um, but he spent those days between that call and that meeting worrying that he was getting fired. But he's Mr. Conscientious. He's there an hour early. He stays hours late. He's conscientious. And he was so worried about it. He was wound up about it. And I said, don't, don't think that way. You don't know what they're, oh, I just know. I just know. It's all over with this job. I just know. They sat him down in that office and gave him a $17,000 raise. And then he comes out of there being real sheepish. And he's like, uh, yeah, I got a raise. Well, you went from being fired to a $17,000 a year raise? A raise? Are you kidding? But he tormented himself for days by reading into it. Well, I'm a pastor. I'm too smart for that. Oh, really? So Mr. Jones, whose daddy wore bucks at your church, Mr. Jones calls you on the phone. He says, Pastor, there's a, there's a matter I need to talk to you. Can we meet on Friday? This is a Monday morning. There's a matter I need to talk about. Can, can we meet on Friday? And you say yes. And you spend the rest of Monday and all the way up into the meeting time figuring out in your mind why Mr. Jones wants to talk to you. And not normally, 90% of the time, you are dead wrong. But you've worried about it over that period of time to the point where it has become an obsession. By the way, I was so prone to that, gentlemen, I was so prone to that that I, th this is what I do. If you call me for an appointment and it's sometime out in the future, I will say, what is the topic we're going to discuss? And they pass the money, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait until the meeting. And I say, no, you're not. I want to know, okay? In generality, don't go into the big deal. Is there a marriage problem? Is, is this a church problem? I want to know something in generality. It keeps me from guessing. Okay, and it keeps me from playing this intuitive game. So beware of intuition. Number two, beware of prognostication. Beware of prognostication. You say, Pastor, what is that? Prognostication is predicting outcomes and forecasting the future, similar to being a wedding, a, a weatherman. Intuitive people often prognosticate. They predict the future based on their supposedly hypersensitive insights. Okay, so not only now are we reading between the lines, but we're predicting future actions, and those predictions make us nervous. Um, the prognostication takes intuition a step further by predicting outcomes and ruminating on them as if they had already happened. Example, the Smith family missed two Sundays at church. They must be upset. They're leaving the church, okay? That's a prediction. That's a prognostication. You don't know that to be true. You assume that to be true. You then think about that, and you violate... 
Philippians 4, verse 8, because you're no longer thinking on things that are true. Or something like this, he grimaced during my sermon. I must have hit a nerve. Now he's angry and will leave the church. I had a real life example of this happen to me. And I, the man who this happened to, I've talked to him about this so I can share this story, had a guy named Gary. It was a Wednesday night, had a guy named Gary in church. And man, I was a faithful man and a good man, never give me any trouble at all. I was preaching on something and, and uh, on Wednesday night and somehow I just slipped off into preaching against Calvin for a moment. I do that every once in a while. I just sort of slip off that. Usually when I'm not prepared to say anything else, I just preach against Calvinism. And so, 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 uh, so I started preaching against Calvinism. And I, I noticed, I noticed Gary was sitting in his pew. And as I was preaching, he's probably four rows back, four or five rows back from the front. He does one of these numbers. Crosses his arms like this and just looked disgruntled. And I thought in my mind, huh. And I'm preaching while I'm thinking this. Because I can do two things at the same time. And I'm thinking, I didn't know Gary was a closet Calvinist. <laughs> really? I, seriously, I'm thinking, I didn't know Gary was a closet Calvinist. And so, I, so I thought, you know, since I obviously touched a nerve, I'm going to, to, to shoot down that rabbit hole. And so for the rest of the sermon, I just denounced Calvinism. I, it wasn't even in the notes. But I was on a roll, and I thought, you know, and I thought, he's irritated, he's mad. Well, uh, he's going to get it, he's going to hear it, and he's going to hear it out of my mouth, and I'm going to let him have it, and it's all over, when, and, and, and I didn't know, and he's not going to ruin my church with that garb. And I just started preaching, kind of directly at him. He just sat there the whole time. After the service, I noticed he walked to one of my assistant pastors and whispered something in his ear, and the assistant pastor said, well, come to my office. And so I'm thinking, yeah, that guy doesn't have the guts to come and tell me he's mad about my sermon. He's going over to Pastor Morris, and he's going to tell Morris they're leaving the church because they're closet Calvinists, and they're Reformed, and they're going to start baptizing babies secretly in their backyard. And, and I just knew all of this was going to happen. And so, so I, I hung around church later, at, and I hung around later waiting for that counseling, uh, counseling session to end. And then Morris comes bebopping down the hallway. I said, Pastor Morris... I said, I didn't know Gary was a Calvinist. They're probably leaving the church, right? And Morris looks at me and he goes, what are you talking about? I said, well, my sermon clearly, clearly I struck a nerve. Preacher, what are you talking about? I said, well, I, I know that's what you were talking about. He said, no. He said, I don't know what you were talking about. He said, he had a really hard time at his job and there's a really major problem at his job. And he was sitting there probably looking unhappy because he's going through a real huge crisis in his personal career. Okay, gentlemen, you know, yeah. Oh, he's passed money. You're just over the top. So are you. Because I know you've done the same thing. And, and frankly, where did the problem come in? The problem came in when I was thinking about something that was not true. I was prognosticating that they would leave the church. Prognostication is forecasting the future, whether it's immediate or distant. It, it produces something called anticipatory anxiety. Okay, fear, Matthew 6, 34, too much thought about tomorrow. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought concerning the things of itself. Okay, if, if I, well, Pastor Money, I'm so worried. I'm so worried about my financial future. I, I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And, 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 and I, I got out of Social Security. And some of us were told to get out of Social Security. I was told to get out of the uh -huh, uh -huh. And we were told to. And now we're older. And we, we haven't done anything except buy lottery tickets once in a while. And that's not working. And so, and so, and so, so we're thinking, what, what am I going to do about the future? And we think far in advance into the future. We anticipate it. And then we, uh, we, we cause it to, in our minds to become a catastrophe and we picture ourselves without a job without a church old and decrepit living under a bridge in a refrigerator box begging for scraps that's not going to happen oh do you know how i know that's not going to happen because the bible says this i've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread okay but you know, Jesus forbade us from thinking about the bad things that could happen tomorrow. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thoughts concerning the things of itself. Listen to this. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Okay, if you want to get wound up about a problem, if you really want to do that, think about today's problem. 
That's what Jesus was saying. Don't think about the possible problems tomorrow. Think about today's problem. Sufficient unto the day, sufficient right now to this day is the evil thereof. There, there's enough evil for me to think about. Evil does not have a moral connotation in that verse. It means something that is negative in consequence. There is enough evil for me to think about or bad things to think about. Now, don't project into the future and don't predict. Prognostication is against the scripture. Sometimes people have anticipatory anxiety from something called ex expectation that it is a desire for a positive result, that, and, and this produces tension about ultimate fulfillment, okay? If we're pl playing a sports event, it can be healthy, I hope I win, okay? Or if we're going to ask, some of you guys are going to ask a girl out sometime, to, I don't know if you all date or court here, that's such a controversy when I talk about this, I don't know if you're in dateship or courtship, or uh, all I know is it's not good for you to end up with a court date, that's all I know, I don't <laughs> really understand all of this, but... Um, but if, and, and, and by, by the way, by the way, guys, by the way, guys, by the way, guys, I see some teenage boys over there. You know, learn, learn how to talk to the girls. Learn how to talk to them, okay? Don't be creepy <laughs> if you're going to like a girl, okay? I heard about one guy who, who walked up in a Christian college. He walked up to a girl that he liked, and he'd never met her before, and he said, he said, hello, my name is Will, God's Will. Okay, that's really <laughs> creepy, okay? Don't, don't. Don't do things like that, boys. Don't <laughs> steer clear of it, okay? That's, that's going to be trouble. Where am I in this thing? What am I talking about? Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, the, 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 the bottom line with what I'm trying, oh, anticipatory. So watch this, watch this. Okay, watch this. I have a counseling session, okay? Pastor Monty, you know, you can't control everything in a counseling session. You're right. Do you know most of the things we deal with in life are partially in our control and partially out of our control. How many know that's true? Yeah. It's pretty much like that's life, okay? Well, Pastor Money, you know, so, so what do you do about that? Don't you get anxious about the things that are not under your control? No, 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 no. I used to. Here's what I've disciplined myself to do now, okay? There's a part of that counseling session. Let's say I'm marriage counseling someone. There's a part of that counseling session that I can control. What is that part? Knowing the scriptures and what the Bible says about marriage knowing the people and understanding, maybe looking at some of the background of their issue, okay, digging a little deeper. I can prepare myself for a counseling session, okay? That is my full responsibility. But you know what I cannot do? I cannot, see some of those boys are being creepy over there right now. I cannot, I cannot predict the outcome. I used to be so worried as a pastor that I was a failure if the outcome wasn't perfect. Gentlemen, can I tell you something? You're dealing with sinners, right? We all have a sinful nature. We're dealing with sinners. And I would worry about the outcome. Here, here's my area of concern. My area of concern is only that which I can do and have control over. And once I know in my heart that I have done my very best, at that point, what they do with it, their response is not my responsibility. Did everybody hear that? And if I get too much into prognostication, I try to predict good outcomes, okay? If I'm playing at a sporting event, uh, playing baseball or something, I don't know if I'm going to win or lose, but I can do the best I can to my possible ability. Um, be careful of that. Prognostication, predicting either good or bad things can cause anxiety. Point D, the problem with ruminating over prognostication is simply this, it hasn't happened. You've gone from reading between the lines to predicting outcomes and you let this circulate in your mind, and it hasn't happened, and therefore, it is not what? True. Okay? By the way, if some of you will cut this out, you won't even know what to think about. I mean, I was almost that way. Okay? You won't even know what to think about. So, beware of prognostication. Oh, here's another one, sort of related, but a little different. Beware of speculation. Speculation. The classic what-if thinking. Wow, this is where my goat is tied. What if thinking? I think about all the what ifs of life. I am a sucker for insurance, life insurance. I'm a sucker for that. I have more life insurance than you can shake a stick at. If I ever die under mysterious uh, circumstances, it was my wife, 
Okay, she did it, okay, because she knows she'd be a very wealthy woman if I were to die. She understands that. But, but what if, and I'm not, I'm in favor of life insurance because I have so much, but, but what if thinking is this? It's speculative thinking considers every what if of life. It examines possible scenarios and then scenarios that are consequential to the possible scenarios. It says, I'm going to cover for every possible contingency and once I've done that, I'm going to think of contingencies to the contingencies, and I'm going to cover for all of that. Stop for a moment. I'm not talking about being reasonable in your preparation and in your thought about life. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about going OCD, what if, what if, what if, what if. Now, this is not only biblically true, this is also scientifically or psychologically true. Things are never as bad as we make them out to be in our mind. The worst case scenario that we build up in our mind to a given situation, uh, it, well, Pastor Monty, if, if this happens, then that's going to happen and the whole thing's going to blow up. And nine times out of ten, even if this does happen, and even if that does happen, the whole thing doesn't really blow up. God is still in control. Oh, oh, by the way, by the way, this what if thinking, you know what it does? It exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Are you following what I'm saying? It, ex it, says, it says, no, you know, there's, God's not really in control. I've got to figure this out. No, what if thinking does that? Okay, well, what is this? Point B, speculative thinking believes that it is preparing for possible contingencies. Point C, speculative people do not cross the bridge when they come to it. Rather, they build bridges where there are no rivers. One of my foster sons confronted me about that. He did. He said, he's a preacher. He said, you build bridges where there are no rivers. He said, you, you try to cover for every possible thing that's going to happen. Can, can, can I tell you something, guys? It'll drive you crazy. It'll drive you crazy. And, and by the way... Can I get spiritual for just a second? After all, this is church. Where's your faith? I might ask you this, where's your God? Where's your God, okay? It's this speculative thinking that pushes away, uh, against the knowledge of God. It's, it's very problematic, okay? The problem with speculative thinking is that it is not true. It's not, well, Pastor Monica, come on, but you, we have to be prepared for every possible contingency. Impossible, okay? Now, it is reasonable, if you're going on a picnic, to pack a picnic lunch and not just pray that manna drop from heaven, okay? That's reasonable to have your picnic lunch. But, but it is not reasonable to make a plan for every possible contingency. It simply doesn't work, and it'll drive you nuts doing it. And pastors do this all the time. Num uh, next one, next one I want to mention. Beware of perception. Beware of perception, okay? Disciplined thinking is like turning on an analog radio. We tune out the static in order to hear the music. Now, now wa watch. How many love analog? Do you love analog? I do. Digital is awful. It's so boring. Remember the old radios where you used to have to turn the knob ever so gently to hone in on that station that you wanted to listen to, that, that, that in the case of some of you, that country western station that you, because you wanted to listen to Johnny Cash, okay, and Ring of Fire. And so, you know, you're just afraid to laugh lest somebody would know that you know what that is, okay? Stop, okay, stop. And you would tune to that country and western station. You would tune to that the Bible station. You would turn to that. This will help you. You would turn, and 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 you knew that if you turned that dial just a second further, you weren't going to get the station. But remember when you t turned that dial, and you hit the sweet spot. How many remember that? You hit, and you, and it was coming crystal clear through those beautiful speakers. And it was just as, and and you had in that moment this little feeling of victory. Remember that? Wow, I did it. I honed in. Kids today, those kids, they don't have that feeling. They don't know what it is to tune a radio and have that great feeling of victory. But what, I, what I'm trying to do with your thinking right now is tune your thinking to be biblical, okay? Beware of perception. Uh, perception is this, my interpretation of the past and present. Emphasis on the word my, okay? I don't want to get too deep here, but my perception is not necessarily reality. 
And that is true of every person in this room. The way I see things is not necessarily a reality. Exaggerated perception produces suspicious mind where people become paranoid about everything because they they perceive something a certain way. He gave me a funny look. He's furious with me. I had a lady, I had a lady who constantly called me on the phone after Sundays and she'd say, Pastor, I just want you to know that I used to be friends with so-and-so. But boy, she just is not my friend anymore. I said, why do you think she's not your friend anymore? Oh, she gave me the dirtiest look. What? That's not evidence of anything. Again, maybe she, women don't have gas, they suffer from gastrointestinal disorders. Um, but maybe that was her problem, okay? Exaggerated perception makes me paranoid, okay? Errors in perception often stem from differences in personality. Can I help you with something? Can I do something? I got, do I have time for this? Because this is so good. Okay, you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna analyze yourself, but you're also gonna analyze your spouse. Real simple here. There are four basic personality profiles. I'm not talking about sanguine and choleric. I don't even know what those words mean, okay? You've heard those words. Here, here I'm gonna give them to you more simple, okay? Here they are, four things. There is power, precise, pleaser, and party. Okay, are those in the notes or not? Are they in your notes? They might be, I don't know. Okay, there are four, four things. Okay, most people, 85% of people in this world are a combination of two of those, two of the four. You have a dominant and you have a recessive, okay? This is just studying people. This is human nature, okay? So, for example, a friend of mine who went to Harvard University and studied this, he was talking to me on the phone. He said, he told me about it. I said, well, I said, Brian, I said, what am I? What am I? What, where do I fall in this? He says, Bonnie, you're easy. He says, you are a power party. Now, let me explain it. Power means you like to be in charge, okay? And I do. Party means that you only, you're motivated by, are you having a good time? Okay, my motivation is, am I having a good time? Kelly will ask me when I get home from the evening, she'll say, how was it? And I'll say, man, I had a blast. It was super fun. I will never say, you know, Kelly, I believe that I was really able to help a bunch of people and then there were a certain number of decisions. I don't, I don't think that way. I'm not worried about the results. I'm worried about whether I'm having fun. <laughs> okay, that's who I am. He said, by the way, he said, you're very rare in fundamental circles to keep, the, to keep the, the party alive. But I'm bringing the fun back to fundamentalism. It's part of my calling and part of my goal. That's who I am, okay? So, so some people are precise. What is precise? Watch this. Music, science, mathematics. These are people with an agenda. These are people who are uncomfortable about going on vacation unless they have a printed agenda for each day and have divided the day down into the hours and they know all of the events and they take their printed agenda and they slide it into a page protector, geeky, 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 and they carry it around in a bound notebook and then they make a second notebook in case the first one gets lost. And then these precise people, the minute something happens that's not according to plan, they freak out. But there's a lot of people like that. Precise people like rules and regulations, huh? Fundamentalism attracts a lot of precise people. Spell it out, preacher! Tell me exactly what I should wear. <laughs> we like that. Precise, that's precise people. Pleaser people are this. They're not happy unless everyone around them is demonstrably happy. Okay, they're not, they're not happy unless, you know, I have a buddy, a pastor friend, he's a pleaser. If you go over to his house, I'll be sitting there, we'll be talking, we'll be having a nice time. And all of a sudden he'll be like, hey, is that chair comfortable enough? Can I get you a different chair? Can I get you a different chair? No, I'm fine. Can I, can I get you a glass of water? No, I'm fine. No, no. And it, it'll drive me nuts. And I'm fine. Stop it. My, my wife, by the way, is a pleaser party. She likes to have a good time like I do. She's a pleaser party personality. We do very well together, okay? Um, here's something I learned about that. I think Dr. Willett said earlier he's not a detail person. I'm not a detail person either, because party people aren't, okay? Some power people are. Pastor Chapel, <laughs> he's precise, <laughs> and he got, he's got the details. I, I don't have any of that. So what I learned is this. I'm just this big, happy guy who likes to declare big vision stuff, and I get these big ideas, and I'm like, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to do this, and it's really going to be fun. And I'm talking to my deacons, and here's what we're going to do. Yeah, this is going to be great. And then I have a deacon that will say something like this. Pastor, have you considered this, 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 and this? <laughs> no! You know why? Because my idea is great. That's why. 
And no, I haven't considered that. I'm not even, and he'll be, but we, we need to do this. And you know what, you know, I used to think this, I used to think this, all that guy does is pour cold water on stuff. I, and I really was down on him until I, wait, 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 wait. His personality is different from mine. Now, let me connect this dot here. The way we perceive things is largely based on personality. He would, he would sit and listen to me preach. And he was a member of the church for decades until he couldn't stand it anymore, but he was there for decades. He, he, would, sit, he would sit in church and he never smiled. He never laughed. He never looked like he was enjoying my great stories and my engaging personality. He never, it just, he just sat there and stared. And I always thought he was mad. He wasn't. You know what? He was just a weirdo. No, he, he, he just had a, his personality was different from mine. But what I was doing is I was taking my personality and I was perceiving him, watch this, through the lens of my personality. And, th and, then, and then based on that, because I'm looking at him through the lens of my personality, based on that, I'm now judging him. I'm now determining how he's thinking. And I've built in my, my mind a case against this person because my perception of him has been filtered through my personality. Is everyone following what, I'm, following what I'm saying here? How careful we have to be about that because it's not all about us. It's not all about personalization. Errors in perception stem from differences in personality. We tend to interpret others through the lens of our own personality, okay? Just because people don't respond when you would, the way you would in a given situation, doesn't mean that they're displeased or that they're upset. And, and do you know what we tend to do? We tend to pile up negative evidence based on our perception about people, and we, we assign them to a certain level of negativity and then we say to ourselves, that's just how it is with them, and we've judged them wrongly. Does everybody follow what I'm saying here? And in the process of doing that, all we do is stir up trouble in our own mind. There are people whose personality simply will, will not match ours. For, for example, for example, this here's one. I'm preaching away, someone's not paying attention, or they're looking kind of mad or something. And then they get up and leave the auditorium. Okay? My perception is, wait a minute, here's my perception. This is a great sermon. That's always my perception of my preaching. If you're going to do it, you might as well think it's good. <laughs> it's a great sermon. And they weren't responding, and they weren't listening. And then they got up and they left. They're angry. No. They might have been listening, taking notes, and really getting a lot out of it, and then they had to go to the bathroom. Okay, probably that's what it was, but my personality is saying because they were not responding the way that I would respond, that there's something wrong. And frankly, that's disobedient to Scripture because the Bible says we're to think upon things that are true. True, what does it mean? What does it mean? Okay. You know how I know you hate me? Yeah. You want to know? Because you walk up and tell me, Pastor Monty, I hate you. Then I know. Yeah. Pretty much a dead ringer. <laughs> Do you know how I know you think the sermon is garbage? You walk up and tell me, Pastor, I think that sermon's garbage, okay? And until you do that, until you give me absolute evidence, I shouldn't be trying to guess. Because when I try to guess, it's not true. It's very, very unsettling. Truth is objective. Perception is subjective. Avoid forming strong opinions based on perception, okay? Strong opinions, folks, require hard evidence. But how many of us, I've gone through years of my ministry before, and this is just one small section of what I'm teaching online, how many of us have gone through years of our ministry tormenting ourselves over a misperception or viewing something through the lens of our personality when it's not that person's personality? It's really important to learn, learn this. In other words, learn to give people the benefit of the doubt. Remember, the human mind is prone toward negative perception, okay? It, it really is. It really is. Um, what do you mean by that? Okay. You, let's see, one of the ladies in the room, you go to the dress barn, which I understand is going out of business, you, so go get the sales now while you can. You go to the dress barn, you buy, you buy a brand new dress. You wear it to church the next Sunday, and some of your friends are, are like, wow, 
It's a beautiful dress. You look very good in that dress. And so five different ladies tell you how wonderful it is. And you, ladies, you are just walking on cloud nine. Woo! I look just great in the Baptist church. I'm, I'm setting the trends in the Baptist church. And then one lady comes up to you and says, that's a nice dress. Do they make it in your size? Oh. Say, Pastor, can I ask you a question? Whose comment are you going to remember? The five people who said it was really nice or the one lady who handed you an underhanded backslap comment? Who's, who's, what are you going to remember? You're going to remember the one. Do you know why? Because we are prone to interpreting things negatively. I think that's part and parcel of our sin nature. And we need to be very careful about that. We need to be cautious in regard to that, how I perceive something. Perception is just that. It's one man's way of seeing things. The trouble is that perception is not always true. Now, now let's summarize. Watch this. Pastor Bonnie, how can I overcome anxiety and depression? And you, I, cannot, I wish I had 12 hours because this is just one small section of what I'm teaching. But let me say this. I cannot... I cannot overcome these things if I'm not obeying the Bible. I can't have God's peace. Part of obeying the Bible is thinking on things that are true. Part of it is understanding that as a man thinketh, my thoughts in his heart, my emotions, so is he, my behaviors. Part of that is recognizing that my thoughts, what I ruminate about, what I continue to meditate upon, my thoughts produce my emotions, my emotions drive my behaviors, sometimes in a very negative way. And part of that is saying, you know, it's time that I learned to obey the Bible in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, and to bring every thought into captivity of Christ. To examine that thought and say, is this something I should be thinking about, or is God, exalt, is God, is God removed from the equation? Is God no longer here? Is this thought exalting itself against the knowledge of God? Is this something that is verifiably true, or am I tormenting myself with my own supposed intelligence. I think I put this, this might be in your outline down there, Seneca. Seneca is an interesting character. Seneca, he was a Stoic philosopher, okay? Stoicism is mentioned in the book of Acts. How many remember when the Jews captured Paul and they brought him to the, 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 the Roman magistrate and the Roman magistrate said, I care for none of these things. Remember that? If it's a question about names and about your Jewish law, he said, I care for none of these things. Do you know why he said that? Because that magistrate was the younger brother of the Stoic philosopher Seneca, who had been teaching his brother not to think about anything that, that wasn't his business. When he records those words in scripture, he was reflecting Stoic thought. But Seneca, I think, said some dumb things, but he said this, this was smart. He said he suffers more than necessary who suffers before it is necessary. And the only thing I can do to stop suffering before it's necessary is to start thinking on things that I know are verifiably true. Okay, this is one small section of, what I, what, of, of the whole teaching that I have, but I wanna, here's what I'm gonna do. I think it's till 3.30, right? Yes, I have six more minutes. Let me open it up for questions here. And then after that, if any guy wants, to, wants me to give him a quick rundown on some, some, the physical aspect of mental health, just come down to the front once we dismiss. Anyone with a question about anything? Or anything you want to ask a question about? Anyone? Are you awake? <laughs> Anyone at all? Any question at all? Yes, back in the back. Yes, ma'am. Wait, wait, wait. Yes, sir. I can't, I can't even see you back there. Yes, sir. Stand up and, and shout. Say it again. Evil forebodings. Evil forebodings. What do you mean by that? Well, I, it, how it was explained to me is that if you dwell on something enough, it can actually become, to, to, can become to fruition. Okay, so you're kind of like talking. If you worry or concern about something enough, or if, you know, if there's an evil thought in your mind or something that continually you know, pushes you down, don't be surprised when it happens. 
Right, you're kind of talking about almost a self-fulfilling prophecy thing. I, I think people can do that to themselves, okay? I, I think that they can build something in their mind to the point where all of a sudden they, they view it as a reality and then they start behaving as if it's a reality. If I think, for example, that my assistant pastor is going to quit and I become convinced that he's going to quit his job, I, I, might, I might start packing his stuff for him. I don't know, you know, it's a possibility. So yes, yeah, but, but again, what you're doing is you're projecting into the future, okay? You're saying, you're saying, I have this sense of doom or foreboding, as you called it, evil foreboding. I have this sense of foreboding and doom, and therefore I'm going to act upon this when all it is is a sense, okay? It is not a fact, and that's really, really important, okay? That was a very good question. Someone else, anyone else with a, with a question? Yes, sir, Paul. Absolutely. He asked, is some of this, does some of this come from insecurity? And the answer to that is yes. Yes, it comes from insecurity. Now, for those who want to stay in, I'm going to talk about some of that. I'm going to talk about a possible physical source of insecurity. But follow what I'm about to say. Our security is in God. Some said, Pastor Monty, you know, God called me this, I know God called me this, but I'm just not cut out for it, and I'm not very good at it, and I, 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 just, I just don't know what I'm doing as a pastor. Look at me, look at me. Can I tell you something? I am more than capable in doing what I do. In fact, let me, and, and, and just, just follow me. I'm good at being a pastor. I'm good at preaching. I'm good at the aspects of my calling. I'm very good at them. I'm excellent at them. Pastor, that just sounds prideful. No, to me it sounds biblical. Do you know why? Here it is, fellas. The Bible says this. God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Did you hear that? Well, Pastor Monty, I, I don't feel sufficient in myself. Oh, Paul said, don't, don't do that. Don't try to feel sufficient in yourself. But do you see the verse? God hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Am I good at pastoring? Yes. Am I good at preaching? Yes. God, now, not because of my innate talent or ability. God's made me able, and God's the one who's called me. And because that is objective truth of the Word of God, that should give me the confidence to go forward because the calling is of God, the position is of God, the ministry is of God, and He's made me able. And by the way, there's nothing good about, well, you know, I'm just humble as an old shoe and I can't really do anything right. Blah, blah. You're not a, you, yeah. Aren't you a child of God? What happened to that concept, okay? Aren't you a God called preacher? What happened to that concept, okay? Why, why can't you stand up straight? with your shoulders back and say, I'm not perfect, but God can use me because he's called me and my confidence is in him. That's what we need as preachers. That was good, Paul. That was a good question. Anyone else with a, with a quick question before we dismiss? All right, if no questions, I'm going to pray. And then any gentlemen who want to come meet me down here, I'll talk about real quick. It won't be long, but I'll talk about a couple of things that could help you from a physical perspective. Lord, we love you. And thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us a list of things that we're to think about. And Lord, we've only touched on one of them today. And yet, Lord, you assume that in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can discipline our minds to stop thinking about things that are disquieting to us, that cause us anxiety. Lord, there are other causes beyond our thinking. and We would gladly talk of these in another time. But Father, right now, help us just to focus on the fact that we need to discipline our thoughts. Any thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God needs to be pushed out of our minds, refused. And Father, we need to exalt in truth. Give us the mental muscle as we discipline ourselves to think according to the scriptures, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. You're dismissed, I guess, until the evening service. But if any men, I'll start in like a minute down here. If any men want to come, this won't be long. You can ask me questions and stuff. I want to help you if you're interested in that kind of help. Because I'm glad to help. If you're just curious about what I'm going to say, come on down. Come on down. You never know what's going to come out of this mouth.